Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming today. This is our inaugural first generation celebration event here at GRCC. Oh! <laughs> When I started here in GRCC's TRIO office on January 4th, 2016, it was one of our goals to be able to have a celebration that didn't just focus on students, but also focused on us, the faculty and staff. I think one of the things that's so important is that for you all who are here as students, that you know and see representation in those of us who are in professional positions. And one of the biggest, I think, misnomers that I had as a first generation to this country and to college is that somehow something magical would happen. <laughs> when I walked across that stage and I got a diploma, like somehow all of the things that make you feel a little different or make you feel a little behind somehow magically goes away and it doesn't. And so one of the things that I'm hoping today can be the start of is remembering that we need to continue supporting each other um, and empowering each other. So being first can be awesome. And that's the flip of the script that we want to start today is that just because we're first generation doesn't mean that we are coming from a deficit. First generation actually means that we are creative. We are ingenious. We are passionate. We might make mistakes, but man, when we make them, we're going to make them on an epic level and we're going to learn so much from it. So I really appreciate all of you taking time out of your day. I know it's really hard to step away from our jobs, especially all the fancy people who are in the back corner over there. Um, all the fancy people are in the back corner. Um, and we, so we have two panels today, but the first thing that we're going to do is start off with some welcome and congratulation remarks from Dr. Olivares and Dr. Canetto. Hello, TRIO members. I wish I could be there with you but at least I can record a message to say how proud I am of each of you. I want to express my gratitude for your courage and determination to continue your education. Your education is the best investment you can make. I know because I too was a first generation college student. I wanted a better economic life than what I grew up with. I wanted more work choices than what my parents had. Going to college changed my life so many more doors opened up for me, and they will open up for you too. Take it a step at a time, but remember that it takes planning and hard work, and don't be afraid to ask for help along the way. Make your family proud and make us all proud. Best wishes to all of you. Hi everyone. I wanna say how happy I am to be able to participate in this celebration with you. And it is a celebration, because you are trailblazers. As the first in your family to pursue post-secondary education, you are taking an important step in your life, but you are also clearing a path for people to follow you. What you are doing today will make a difference in your life and also in the lives of others because you are setting an example and sending a message that education is important. That is exciting and probably a bit scary, but I want to assure you that GRCC is invested in your success. We are here to walk alongside you in this journey and support you in any way we can. So when you face an obstacle, remember that GRCC has tutoring, advising, and friendly faces to help you overcome that obstacle. I want to wish you the best of luck because you belong at GRCC, and I am happy that you're here. I think it's pretty cool that we work at an institution where the president and the provost will take time out of their ridiculous schedules to do things like this for us. Stuff like that is really important. I am a crier, so forgive me if I do, but when I was watching those videos, I totally cried several times. Um, but we're going to move into, because I know everybody's time is pretty precious, we're going to start our student panel. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but TRIO is a little known for being a little late. So <laughs> we have, so I'm not calling you out, Eric, at all. Um, we have a couple of panelists that um, hopefully will still be coming, but we're going to get started in the interest of time. So this is our student alumni panel. So these are three gentlemen who came here to GRCC, graduated, have gone on, earned their degrees, and are doing some pretty fantastic things. But instead of me talking about them, I'd like for each of them to take a moment to introduce themselves, starting on this side. Hello. 
My name is Raymond Gant. I currently work at Calvin University and serve as the registration coordinator for the school. I attended here back in 2012 is when I graduated here, and I was a, a joint trio back about a semester after I started here back in 2010. Hi, um, my name is DeAndre Bridgman. I attended here um, in 2018 is when I finished my degree in a background in psychology. I'm now currently working for the city of Grand Rapids and also GRPS. My name is Eric Davis. Um, I own a business here called Last Mile Cafe. Um, I attended from 2009 to 2000, I think 13 and I ended up transferring to Michigan Tech and got a degree in electrical engineering there, where classes started at uh, five after, so I thought I was early. <laughs> For gentlemen joining us, I'm gonna give them, can I take this off? Can I take this off? I wanna be off camera. Um, hi everyone, my name is Fernando. Um, um, what, what am I supposed to say? Oh, so uh, I graduated in 2020 and 2021 from the University of Michigan. Right now I work for uh, this consulting firm called Accenture. And um, yeah, I was uh, in GRCC from 2016 to 2018. That's when I was with TRIO. So this is our panel. We have one more gentleman that may be joining us, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Let me back up this way. So gentlemen, I'm going to ask each of you the same question. And Eric, I'm going to start with you if that's OK. So the first question is, what or who was most motivating for you? Yeah, I think um, Ana Maria has to be the one. Like I talk about her <laughs> to this day, just for really understanding where I was, caring, and there were a lot of people, you know, on this campus that you just have to find that connected with you. But if I had to pick out a particular person, it was definitely Ana Maria for just understanding where I was, helping connect me with resources, and really pushing me to do the things that I needed to do for myself. So I'll always be grateful to her for that. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. DeAndre. Um, what motivated me in my um, journey in education was the fact that no one in my family has went to college. Um, I didn't graduate traditionally from a high school. I obtained my GED, um, and I knew that wasn't enough to operate and facilitate in this society. Thanks. Go ahead. I think Ana Maria played a huge role in motivating me as well. I think in my experience, I only know of one animal that hunts humans, and that'd be polar bears. But Ana Maria, <laughs> you make a close second. <laughs> I love that answer so much. It's so true. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Fernando. Um, I, w I would have to say Ana Maria, too. But also, uh, I don't know, I, I just connected with her because uh, I grew up in South America, I grew up in Ecuador, and she is from Chile, and uh, just just uh, that, like, I just hit it off with her immediately, we could speak in Spanish, and, like, she understood what, where I was coming from, so she really pushed me and helped me out as well. Thank you, gentlemen. The next question, Eric, I'm going to come back down to you if that's okay. What support services were most beneficial to you during your journey? And that doesn't have to just be here at GRCC, but after GRCC, maybe even in your professional life. Yeah, I think, you know, it might have been something that I found in myself of just like learning to ask for help. Um, I think while I was at GRCC, I definitely went to the learning centers a lot. The reading learning center, the writing learning center, the math learning center, <laughs> um, and like utilize those peers a lot of the times to just help get my classes done and then going to my teachers as well. So I think the support, and maybe I just got lucky with GRCC and like professionally here in the city and with Michigan Tech, but getting lucky three times doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think that there are a lot of people that are out there that are willing to help you, but you have to do a little bit of work to know what help you need and then be willing to go and ask for it. But definitely the resources that I mentioned here on campus. Thank you, Eric. DeAndre. 
Um, for me, it was a combination of um, Trio SSS and um, Alpha, Beta, Omega, ABO. Um, both of those services helped me get out of my element. Um, I had a lot of chance, they gave me chances, opportunities to go to other colleges, campuses, um, um, help me with like food. <laughs> um, also just a community of supporters. That was the biggest thing. Thank you. I think TRIO exposed me to the variety of resources that are available for me in particular. Just knowing that I have a resource there to help me is enough to get, make me want to try. And so if you don't have or know where you can go for help, you might not even feel motivated to try. And so just having the information and knowing that there are places available helped me a lot. On top of the, what I think is the most underused resource on any college or any university campus is office hours for your instructor going to the instructor, communicating with them, talking with them, because they just want to understand you and understand where you're at so that they can help you get to the next level. You got some big claps in the back corner from the faculty <laughs> on that one. <laughs> Thank you. Fernando. Um, I think um, I used to go to the uh, labs a lot, like the science lab and the business lab. I actually worked at the business lab for a little bit, and I got to meet like, most of the faculty and the professors. and just talking to them about their journey, like where they're at now and where they started when they started college, just uh, talking to like all the people that already went through that, um, that really helped me a lot to like figure out where I wanted to go. And also talking to the students, like the student tutors that, that um, work at those labs, they're, they're also going through their own journey. But they could be a little more ahead on you and you can gain a lot of experience from just talking to some people and, and coming here too, like I'm talking with Ana Maria, like she's the one that it was mostly about she's she's helped so many students go through the journey and um, I could just come here and like talk to her and that was that was always nice. Thank you. Okay, the third question that we have, I'm going to switch it up a little bit and I'm going to go first to Raymond. Raymond, what was the expectation of college versus the reality of college? So when you thought about coming to college, what did you think it was going to be like versus what you experienced? So I come from a small town, small class. I graduated with 48 people in high school. So my perceptions of what college would be was a little more actively involved. People knew each other and everyone kind of knew each other. And when, when you get to school, you realize that everyone is way more like you than you realize and that we're all here trying to find that path and find that way. Kind of expected people to know things that I didn't know and kind of everyone know, have a way and have direction that I didn't have. Um, but finding here, and you're finding that everyone's also trying to find the direction, and that gives you kind of a peace of mind and knowing you're not lagging. Thank you. DeAndre. Um, for me, it was more, I was expecting like students to be uh, more together, tackling social issues, um, things of that nature. Um, studying hard, but when I got to college, I realized a lot of people had jobs. Um, a lot of people are um, trying to make it, and they got to do what they need to do for themselves, um, um, which is okay. Um, also, with the academics side of things, um, I expected teachers just to give you your work and you just go do it but I didn't know it was that many resources available on campus. I underestimated um, how many just like genuine relationships I would build. Like I didn't have a lot of friends in like high school and I kind of just felt like college is gonna be the same way. But what you realize is you find people that are like in your major or in your cohort or like on the same path as you. And like that was just kind of like an unexpected pleasantry. And then also how much I could create my own path. I thought it was like, oh, if you do engineering and you do that degree, you have to do that, but you really start to see like, oh, I can create my own path and find these other opportunities. I love that, thank you. Fernando. Um, I, um, I, I didn't expect, um, I don't know, I, when, when I came to uh, Jersey City, I found a lot of more uh, driven people, like people that wanted to learn and um, I really enjoyed my time here, but after I transferred and um, 
I went to like a big college. It was a little bit overwhelming. It wasn't anything like the GCC. And um, I just found that everybody was on, on their own path, like trying to do what they wanted. And um, and everybody everybody struggles somehow. But uh, at the end of the day, it all, it all depends on, on what you wanted to do through college. Like college was like pretty much I thought it was a place that you would just go and study, but it's it's more of a place for you like go and like learn what you want to do and like pretty much like find yourself what, what you want to do when you start working or like after you graduate and stuff. If you want to keep studying, if you want to research, you will just want to go straight to work or um, I don't know. It was just a place where I could where everybody's there just to, like find themselves, find what they want to do with life. Thank you. If, if you think about your experience and you look at the people here in the room and the people who hopefully will, that will watch this video in the time to come, what would be one piece of advice that you would give somebody just starting out in college? Um, I would say like, and, and you know this, you've heard this before, but like you're not going to get this time back um, and life is just going to keep going forward and even if you live forever <laughs> you know this moment that you have here like you 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 don't get to do it again so like really make the most of it like just every day figure out like what it is that you want to do and just try to find people that are going to uplift you towards that and I know a lot of you have heard that before but um, definitely just try to find those people that are going to like bring light to you when you tell them about the things you want to do. They support you and they hold you accountable um, and just really take advantage of this space and this opportunity and the people around you. Thanks. Who's next? I'll go. Um, it's a collage of things, a collective. Um, I will say if I'm gonna give advice to someone, I'm I'm trying to get them advice to like be successful in this atmosphere. So like, yo, sit in the front room, front row of your classes, do all your assignments. You don't have to pass all your exams. Just do good enough. <laughs> um, show up to class and you will pass. You will pass. But not just show up, right? I I also heard him say, do your assignments. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sit in the front row, like. There was a litany of things in there. I would say um, traditional, a lot of students tend to fall into this path where they start to think in linear terms. And they think that this is the direction I have to go. These are the things I have to check off my list in order to get to where I need to go. And I would say try your best to avoid that. Because every situation that you encounter, every person that you're, that you're with, there is meat in that situation. So take the meat and throw away the bone. Use that meat and apply it to yourself and return it in service because you can't get anywhere by yourself. And so returning the things that you're experiencing in class, the things you're experiencing with your advisors, what you're experiencing in your student organizations, apply that in the different avenues. Test, experiment, try, and fail. And failure is not a bad thing. This is the perfect place to fail. This is a safe space to fail. And that's where you have to get your mind around is that it's not a place where I have to succeed all the time. No, this is a place designed for you to fail. And it's OK, because we're here to teach you and guide you to get you on that path. Thank you. Fernando, what would you say? Um, I would say uh, something similar about uh, what, Eric, what uh, Eric said at the beginning. but. Uh, I also, I also think that this is a space where you, get, you can fail, but um, I always had this like philosophy about college and like why we pay for college. Basically, like are we go to if we go to class, we pay attention to class, we do our homework. Like we should learn something about. It's not meant for us to be stressful. If not, why why are we paying for it? But um, at the end of the day, more importantly than uh, than like. Um, passing the class or passing all your classes with an eight. More importantly is like knowing why why you're doing why you're taking the class you're taking, where you want to go, you have to have your, your goal set up straight and and, um, and figure out if what you're studying, what you pass, what you're going through, it's uh is what you want to do. But but most importantly of all like have fun, like talk to other people, like learn more about your peers. Like it's all about learning from others too. That's why college is so big and we're all together. But yeah, most importantly, have fun and uh, take it take it a step at a time. Don't don't rush too quickly into things. I like that message. 
This is an opportunity now for those of us here in the room to ask questions to the panelists. Does anybody have a question that they'd want to throw out there or a comment? Anna, I know you have a comment. Oh, wait. I thank y'all so much um, because this is my first year back in college in over 20 years, and I find myself failing. And I needed you to say that because my student, like the classroom, everybody's doing well. And I'm like, mm, I ain't doing so well. But I'm grateful to learn. I'm grateful to pass or fail these quizzes. I'm passing now, y'all. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm passing. Um, but my professor came and showed me how to pass because you're right. Um, after 30 years of not being in school, I was like, man, here we go. I don't know what this is going to be. But it didn't stop me from coming. It's not stopping me from learning. Um, I know that you're supposed to come to school and do well and 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 turn in all your assignments but there's sometimes there's things like life and it you have challenges and this school meets your challenges this team of trio the the staff my success coach they meet you where you are and they say hey we can help you get where you need to go. And just listening to this panel of people who sh passed, struggled, failed, and continued, it's so inspiring. I'm so grateful um, to be here listening to people who had the same experience and strength that I had in school, so thank you. Thank you, glad to have you here. Yeah, Good. I was gonna say thank you as well for sharing that. and. Um, congratulations on figuring this out. I mean, and also just realizing that you kind of have an opportunity. One of the things that worked for me, because I wasn't a very strong student, um, but those people that you think have it together, go talk to them. <laughs> like actually like get to know them and figure out like what's working for them. And I think what you'll realize is they're struggling in their own ways too, but maybe they can help you through the parts that you know you need help with. Thank you. Anybody else? Hello. Um, so I had a question for uh, you. Your name is Eric, right? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you went to the school for four years, you said? 2009, 2013? Yeah. Okay, and um, within that, um, did you take time off and then come back? And then um, from the times you were going through continuously going to the school year after year. And I'm pretty sure people are probably thinking you're probably not gonna ever uh, graduate from community college. How did you uh, support yourself mentally uh, to overcome those barriers of um, just going through a community college for long and then eventually becoming an electrical engineer? Yeah, so I, I didn't know what I wanted, but I knew what I didn't want. And um, I definitely had some strong semesters in the beginning, and I had some classes that I did have to repeat. Um, but everyone is on their own journey, like especially in this place, right? Like I know there's the one year, two year paths, but that doesn't mean that has to be your path. So I think for me mentally, it was knowing like I am here, I, ha I had a daughter at the time, I had family stuff going on, like I could be here all day, <laughs> you know, just telling you all the adversity that I faced, you know, before and after being here, but you, I had my own path, I had my own struggles that I was going through, and I found people that supported me and helped me through that. So if you feel like you're in the right spot and you are still trying to figure out like what it is that you wanna do, like focus on that. And don't try to compare yourself to the person that came in and out in two years with a four-point GPA because they might be headed somewhere that you're not even trying to go. Does that answer your question? Anything, did you have a follow-up or anything for someone else to add? Saying that because um, I, um, this is also like my fourth year here and um, this is my last year. 
And, um, <laughs> and um, I had some challenges too, you know. Um, like I'm the first generation and my mother, she never went to college with my father. And um, like I went to like foster care and stuff too. So a lot of stuff I've been trying to do, I've been like trying to figure out on my own. And um, like a big support system I have here with this course trio. And um, Evan, um, he's been helping me out a lot this semester also. Like I try to meet with him like twice a month if I can, three times, you know. Uh, I try to see him as much as I can, but he's been really encouraging me. And um, like I wanna go into medicine, I would like to be a physician. And um, I kind of uh, was down on myself because I thought I couldn't do it because in high school, I was like, maybe you're not smart enough because you weren't given a certain um, road, you know, a certain path. But being here has uh, like allowed me to realize that I can create my own story and my own destiny. And uh, just hearing somebody, especially somebody that looks like me, uh, go through something like that, uh, it really does encourage me. So I just want to say thank you just for sharing that. You don't have to be vulnerable. You know, you can say things to make yourself look good, but I appreciate the vulnerability in your statements. Can I say something to add Absolutely. To that? So I completely understand where you're coming from. My first semester here at Grandma's Community College, I had 90 level classes. Right. I also it took me four years to get through this institution. OK, um, so like I always tell students like some motion is better than no motion. Right. As long as you progression, that's all that matters. Maybe you started off with four classes, but you completed three. Right. So. Man, I tell you, I just look at other students schedule. I'm like, why are you all in 100 classes? I, why you ain't got no practice? <laughs> so but. It's, it's a lot of challenges you're going to go through. So I'm glad you're still here as well and pushing forward. Yeah. Agreed. Does anybody else want to answer that question? Uh, trust the process. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, at the end of the day, it's all about growth. And the more you're like better in yourself, that's what matters. Absolutely. Does anybody else have something? Because if not, I have questions too. <laughs> Okay, so this is going to be kind of complex. <laughs> um, I was adopted around the age of eight by my grandmother. She's almost 80, and it's my second year. And I am terrified with the fact that I'm going into teaching because it's not easier, I should say, but it gets you in the pathway faster with getting your bachelor's and then going into teaching. And I've been struggling with the fact that part of me really wants to be an OBGYN. But then the other part of me is like, I'm going to be probably 21, 22 on my own, trying to do all this stuff, juggling school, work, all other things with life. And so it's like, how do you know what the right thing is for you? Because I always thought teaching wasn't for me. But then there was fertility and OBGYN, and I'm like, that also sounds really good. And so now I'm just stuck because I feel like I have a barrier on the fact that like, I struggle, I guess, with the fact that I'm going to be alone at such a young age. Like people are like, you have your family by your side. And I'm like, I understand that, but I don't have that support barrier. And so it's in that way where I'm like, do I just go the easy route and not get in debt possibly, or take and get my doctorates and be 50 paying off college loans? These are my favorite questions. I got to jump in. You already know the answer. You said it. I think everyone up here listening heard you say, like, you know what you want to do. I think one thing that I'll point out is that you don't have to choose. You can do both. And, like, you're going to be here for a long time. So don't be scared that you have to go to school for eight, ten years to do what you ultimately want to do. Because you're going to, you're going to, like we were talking about earlier, you're going to finish this program, you're going to go out into the real world, and you're going to live 80, 90, 100 years thinking back like, oh, maybe I should have made that investment and went and did what I really want to do. So I'm not saying you have to go be a doctor, but you ultimately know in your heart what you want to do. And I think you have to trust in yourself, trust in the process, and don't, don't play yourself small. 
And if you want to go be a doctor and then go be a teacher, you can do that. If you want to be a teacher and then you want to go be a doctor, you can do that. Like, it's your path. Yeah. So really trust yourself. I think you already know the answer. Also, I would like to tell you that one of the biggest things I did, I, I was battling what I, what I wanted to do and be, um, just keep talking to people, networking with people, come to events like this, mm -hmm. you'll find your answer. But consistently talk to people in the careers that you're pursuing. Yeah. yeah. I, would, I would suggest <laughs> seeking out a mentor, someone that will guide you, not just necessarily during a particular phase in life, but someone that's going to be there for you mm -hmm. all the time, like consistently, whether it's an instructor, a former teacher, or someone that you've had in the past, just to reach out to them. And then continue to bounce ideas off them through that time. And if you, as you do that, they'll help you form those questions that you want to ask other people in your life. And that will help find, and people will give you light, shed light on different paths and how they got to where they're at. Everyone's gotten where they're at in different ways. And there's so many different ways to get to anywhere you want to get. Mm -hmm. So don't limit yourself, going back to that thinking in linear terms. Try not to think in linear terms that you have to do this specific thing to get to where you need to go. So things will open up as you go. People will shed light other opportunities will come up and those things will help feed into that process too. I'll just add one more little thing too that you reminded me of that like, I'm giving you permission to call every doctor <laughs> directly. Just go on Google, type in the ones you want and like call them and ask them questions or ask to set a meeting with them or show up at their office, say Eric said I can come say hi to you <laughs> and like ask them about their process because that mentorship is super important. Whatever path you pick and this applies to everyone, like find those people that have done it. This is what I was telling the lady earlier, like wherever you are, find someone that has done it and try to figure out how to model their success. And those people will answer your calls. They will call you back. They will take meetings with you. It might take a hundred tries, but they will help you. I know we have limited time, so I'm not gonna go farther, too far on this, but it's like the fact also like, I want to be a doctor, but I want to be a teacher, but I also <laughs> suck at math and science. So like, below, below, below. And it's like, it's in the fact where like, your parents wanna support you and they wanna be there for you, but they're like, choose classes that are gonna be good for you, that are gonna be easy for you, that are gonna help you in the pathway. And it's like, they're trying to support you, but I feel like it's almost belittling at the same time because you're like, well, I can do it. But at the same time, you're like feeling you can't do it. I, I know more about engineering and like we did a lot of math and I struggled a lot. This is why I was in the learning center so much and in my teacher's office hours, but like it actually gets easier. Like you're really using after you graduate, right? Like a lot of the math and stuff that you're doing, like I don't know any doctor that's like doing math off to the side. <laughs> so like I wouldn't like I wouldn't let that fear get to you. There are resources there. It is gonna be hard, but like you can do it. There are people to support you in that process. Thanks for asking that question. So I wanted to ask a question, and I know some of you had an opportunity to sit and get videoed and answer this, but what does it mean to be first generation to each of you? Fernando, may I ask? Of course you just took a drink of water. I apologize. <laughs> Can I start with you? Yeah. Um, to me, being first generation means like uh, being uh, the first one in your family to uh, go to college. but. Um, at the same time, it's it's like uh, you're you're the first generation that's looking for like a higher learning or knowledge at the same time. Like that's that's what I think it is. Thanks. I think it means for first generation to be mobile professionally. You don't you're not necessarily geared or driven to do one thing in particular, or you don't have all this, this uh, safety net of information that you've been provided. Instead, you're looking to see what's available and what you can pursue and what you can take advantage of. So being mobile professionally, being um, flexible and being open to the, the varying things that are out there, I think that's a big part of being first gen. Thanks. I agree. Um, th just the opportunity to be first, unfortunately, right? And then also it's like, um, I get to explore a path that no one else got to explore. Um, and it's a safe path. Um, yeah. And then I get to change the trajectory of my family. 
Um, I come from a pretty big family. And the fact that the next generation can look at me and say, hey, I have to do better. And I'm the only one in my family not to graduate from high school. So like, it's like bragging rights a little bit, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what it means to be first gen to me. I think, you know, superficially, you know, it means more money. It means that you can help more people. Um, and I think me, for me, it's really like, I've broken down barriers for my family. Like other people know that I can do it. And I think that by me, you know, being the first one to do it, like my nieces, my nephews, like my daughters and their kids don't have to be the first. So I think that, you know, this small accomplishment that I have is hopefully inspiring and creating momentum for a whole nother generation um, of people. Awesome. Who else has an answer to that? I think it's very inspiring. Um, it has taken me about 20 years to, to go back to school. And uh, I immigrated from Mexico. And I did a GED. It took me about seven years. And it's taken me all this time to come back to school for uh, money reasons. But um, it's my first semester here. And it's been very, very hard to me, especially on the um, technology side, but I'm learning and listening to all of you. It's like, okay, they did it. Now I can do it too. So it's an inspiration. And uh, I'm a first generation too. I'm an immigrant. And uh, I tell my son, well, I did it. Now you have to do it. <laughs> I don't know if he's going to do it, but I hope he does. Thank you. Who else? Um, I would say first generation to me was like um, a motivation. Watching my family struggle. Um, they were hustlers, I will say that, <laughs> definitely. But it was that drive of watching them have to do four jobs just to provide for our family. And me just growing up, not having to ask, but I don't want to expect anything from them. I want to give back. So being a first generation, I'm just like, okay, hey, I pushed myself this far, so maybe I can uplift the next person. So first generation is definitely one of those. When you come up, somebody else has to come up with you. So that's what it is. So my first generation was a long time ago, but <laughs> that experience, being a first generation, um, college graduate um, allows me, affords me the opportunity to help my daughter navigate through the system a little differently, a lot differently than what I had to navigate through and hopefully prevent her from having that mini mansion worth of student loans that I now have. <laughs> student loans are no joke. Anybody else? I'm coming to the back table because y'all awful quiet. <laughs> Um, so for me, gosh, you put me on the spot, Mickey. <laughs> um, I think for me, it was just the, you know, it, it is difficult. Life's difficult. There's a lot of challenges. Um, my, you know, I was always told you have to go to school. You have to do whatever you have to do to get through it. Um, when I was going away to school, like community college wasn't the thing people did. Um, and so I went away to a four year school and pushed through and have way too many loans now because what you did was you applied for your loans and if you, you just took whatever they gave you and that's how you lived and that's how you did things. And um, I didn't have advice to say otherwise. And so that's what I did. And then I went to grad school and took out more loans and did all that. And so it is hard not having um, somebody there to guide you and talk you through um, what other options there might be. Um, so I am proud of all of you who have made these choices to come here to GRCC and that we have the resources available to talk through different things and show you options and that 
taking out $100,000 worth of student loans is not the best choice. And you don't have to come to school knowing what you want to do. You can make that decision. So for me, I went to school and I thought I wanted to be a teacher and always thought I did. And then I was like, oh no, I wanna do something else. I decided to go into student affairs because it was fun planning events for students. I'm like, I can be a college student forever like and plan events? Yeah, you can. Um, and now I work in human resources. And so you can make that transition at any time and do what you want. Um, I think somebody said like, you can start in one and go to the other or flip flop and that is possible. So good luck to all of you. So I have one more question. When you started college, you had an idea, you had a degree. Is that the one you finished with? I, I did not finish with that degree. <laughs> I, I started thinking that I wanted to be a, an engineer, like electrical engineer. I was, I was good at math and science, so it just felt like the right path, and it just made a lot of money, so I thought, Maybe this is for me, so I, I went with that pad, just took a bunch of science and math classes and landed in a programming class. And then I I was really I really enjoyed it, like programming. I thought it was like like the future too, so I was like it wasn't hard for me. I was like, okay, I can I could probably make money out of this and it's not that hard for me. So I'm just gonna follow this. I decided to go with computer science and then I uh, I ended up uh, studying uh, data analytics. And um, thanks to like uh, like a program that the uh, the University of Michigan was offering, I, I really I really just applied to it because uh, if you got accepted, they would give you a two hundred fifty dollars stipend. So I was like, it's pretty it's pretty cool. And um, I went through it. They taught me everything about the program, about uh, how data science worked, and I thought to myself, this is this is what I want to do. This is I I want to learn more about where the future is going, where like artificial intelligence, like machine learning is going, and I ended up doing that, <laughs> not engineering. Thanks, Fernando. I started out science major, just all science driven. I love science. I still love science. I'm pretty good at it, I'd say. But then um, about halfway through, I realized my passion was more in people and equity. And so I ended up changing my major to sociology and community studies. And so that's what I ended up graduating with. Thanks, Ray. Um, I entered college wanting to go into counseling. Um, I st still stayed around the rim of that, um, but I started being interested more in perception and how the mind works and people and behavior, so I started studying psychology. Um, yes, but only because I'm super stubborn. I decided I was gonna be an electrical engineer in sixth grade, so. I finished, I got my degree in electrical engineering, but I ended up doing like software development like as my job. And then I now I run a coffee business which does a lot with technology. So I got the piece of paper that says I'm an electrical engineer. <laughs> I think one of the things that I love so much about all of the things that you've shared and some of the things that our audience members have shared is that there's fluidity. Um, in being first generation and there's fluidity in the versions of us that come up as we learn more things. I know in TRIO we often say we don't know what we don't know and that kind of feels like the hallmark of being first generation at any experience. But you've all offered a lot of really good feedback and advice in terms of the experience of college. Is there any feedback or advice that you would offer as young professionals now, having graduated from college? Um, I just want to throw this out there before I forget, but like both of you said you wanted to be doctors, so you two should like connect and learn from each other and like you're getting out of school a little bit sooner. So like, I mean, that's, I think that's my advice is like your relationships matter so much more than anything else. Like. No one has ever asked for that piece of paper. You should go get your degree. Anna Maria would be mad at me if I told you you didn't have to. But um, maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> but um, that piece of paper matters, but these connections and the people you have in this room, like that's gonna help you get the job offer, like cut the interview process. Like I've gotten jobs from like, someone called me and was like, hey, I heard you were looking for a job. And I was like, well, I'm looking to make this much money. And they were like, cool, when can you start? 
right? Like I didn't put an application in, I didn't send a resume or anything. So don't underestimate the value of building those relationships and maintaining them. Awesome, thanks. Um, my advice is, um, I heard someone say, things could be hard, I think it was you. Um, I want you to remember that, don't, don't try to use hard, just say it's a challenge, yeah. okay? Because when you use the word hard, it kind of defeats all those billions of cells in your body, right? So say it's a challenge. Um, also, um, Quizlet. Quizlet will help you out a lot, <laughs> <laughs> okay? So that'll help you navigate those nights where you're just too tired to study. Thanks. I think um, one of the biggest pieces of enlightenment that I had post-graduation was realizing that it's really on me to find, find that path and that I had and have all these resources around me to ask questions and help discover that. And people are there to support you in that. Um, in a way, it kind of answers one of your questions earlier about how you said you had family members are telling you not to take these math classes and these classes that that they don't necessarily understand the return on investment that you have in your education if they don't have that same experience. And so you seeing that, it's, it's on you to, to, to find those people that are there to support you in that and, on, and having people that are professionals in your career that you, want to be, that you want to be to ask those questions so they can help give you that feedback and advice along that way because they've done it. And so understanding that it's on you and you have the power to do it, you just have to do it. And then post-graduation, it's action. It's, it's, it's action before that. It's really action like a year before graduation, but it's action. Can I just add one more thing you reminded me of? Um, it took me like three years of therapy to get this, but don't let, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the way I remember it. Don't let someone that's crazy convince you that you're crazy. Like, don't let someone that hasn't done the things that you've tried to do tell you what you can do. And that doesn't mean that they don't love you, but they just haven't been there. They haven't figured it out, so they can't give you the answer. So you had just reminded me of that. Thank you. Thanks, Fernando. I'm with this, uh, with Eric. Like, if there's one thing I learned uh, after graduating and going through college was that uh, connections matter. Like, networking, it's everything in the world. Like, the more people you know that work in your profession, the better you will be, I guess. Awesome. Thanks. It is about 12.15, and we're coming to the end of our time, which is really disappointing to me because I thoroughly enjoyed this. And I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to each of you because these are very, very busy gentlemen right here. Um, and trying to coordinate and, and in, in the trio world, I don't know for those of you who have experienced it, sometimes we do things on the fly. And what I really appreciate is all of these gentlemen, when we put the call out for the ask for help, they came back. And so when they talk about remembering to give back to the people that helped you, they are the embodiment of people who remembered and they continue to give back to us. And so I am forever grateful for all of them. So for big round of applause. I also wanted to give a moment to say thanks. So the shirts that they are wearing, the shirts that some of you also have that say I am first generation were graciously donated to us by the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, we are very grateful for that and we hope you wear them really proudly because honestly, I'm super proud to be a first generation college student. I am super proud to be able to be in this position and to share this community with you. So thank you to all of you for being here. Um, if you still have time, we have more food. Um, we have raffles. If you did not sign up for a raffle, if you like the sweatshirt, first to try, first to succeed, first to finish, um, there's a raffle for it. So please put in your raffle ticket. Uh, following this panel presentation, we're going to have another panel presentation of faculty and staff here at GRCC to, because again, just because we walk across the stage does not mean that the things that can trying to trip us up as a first generation, the first time experiencing thing, it doesn't mean they magically go away. So if you have time to listen to faculty and staff, please stay and continue joining and communing with us. Thanks so much.
Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for being part of the second component, the second panel presentation today. My name is Victoria Powers. I am the program director for TRIO Student Support Services and TRIO Student Support Services STEM here at GRCC. Um, TRIO is a federally funded grant through the U.S. Department of Education and our mission is to identify, support, and encourage students who are underrepresented first generation and or low income students pursue higher education and complete complete emphasis on complete the degree. So thanks so much for being here. This is the very first time we've ever been able to have an event like this. And so it's kind of a massive dream that is coming to fruition and we are exhausted, but we are so happy to have you here. The first panel that we had was celebrating our uh, students who have graduated from GRCC, so our student alumni panel. This is our faculty staff panel because again, I'm gonna keep reiterating, first generation doesn't go away just because you walk across the stage. So we wanna make sure to have equal representation from many backgrounds. So we are very blessed today to have faculty staff here from GRCC, and I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Christy Hake. Thanks. Um, I'm Dr. Christy Hake. I'm the Dean of the School of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, and my doctor part of my title um, is Neuroscience. So brain, spinal cord, all that fun stuff. My focus was on um, developing models and treatments for neurological diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Um, I was a faculty member, and I became a department head, and then also a dean, and I am now a dean here at GRCC. And, of course, a first-generation college student. Woohoo! Woo Alejandra. Hi, my name is Alejandra Samor Hernandez. Um, I work in the TRIO program as a success navigator, and I, I am first-gen. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Ale. Dr. Young. How you doing? I'm Ennis Young. Um, I teach here in the uh, psychology department at Grand Rapids Community College. Thank you, Dr. Resendez. Uh, hello, guys. My name is Jonathan Resendez, and I am currently uh, serving as an interim AD, uh, associate dean for the School of STEM. Uh, but I'm also uh, CIS faculty, uh, and I just started, this is just my third, it will, it will be in my third year as a, as a faculty member. Does That's everybody awesome. know what CIS is? CIS is a computer information system, so uh, I teach a lot of the programming classes. And uh, Jonathan was instrumental. We, <laughs> we were relocated for a short period of time over in the ATC building. And we're like, we want to try to get more students interested in, in computers. And, we're, and Jonathan, <laughs> bless his heart, he was just walking down the hallway. <laughs> we're like, hey, come help us. And he helped us identify free programming software that we could put on computers for students to get exposure to. And we're just learning all sorts of stuff. So it's been really awesome having a partnership. But I'm going to formally kick off the, our panel conversation and discussion. We have some scripted questions that we're going to ask the panelists, and then just a couple of non-scripted that are very easy, because I'm looking at Ale, and I can already see the, the, the concern. Um, but we're also going to open it up to the audience for any of you to ask questions to our panelists the same way that we did with our student panel presentation. But my first question is just if you would be willing to please share what where it is that you graduated in your undergraduate and or graduate degrees? Sure. Um, so I did all of my degrees at Central Michigan University. Yeah, right? Fire up chips. Um, and I started as a biology major, where is she? was just here, um, and really knew I was going to be a doctor of some sort. I didn't even really know what that meant. Um, at first, I thought it meant um, being a physician, because in biology, you're either going to be a teacher or a doctor. That's kind of what you know about. Um, and then I started interacting with professors, which was terrifying. And I started learning a whole lot more about what was out there in the world with someone who loved biology. So CMU. Awesome. Thank you. Ale. Um, so I graduated from Grand Valley State University. Um, my undergrad is in Spanish, um, mostly focused on interpretation and um, document translation for the medical field and the legal field. Um, but yes, that's where I graduated from. Go Lakers. Go Lakers. Thanks. 
Dr. Young. Well, I, I got my associate's degree in philosophy here at Grand Rapids Community College. Um, my bachelor's degree was in psychology at uh, Grand Valley State University. My master's was in social work at Grand Valley State University. And PhD work in performance psychology is at uh, Grand Canyon University, where I'm trying to finalize my dissertation now. So, <laughs> trying to, trying to. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that called the EBD? E e -B all but dissertation? Uh, every bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Edison. So I actually went to school in Texas. Uh, I went to a community college in Texas, uh, in Dallas. And then I transferred to a four-year school, which is UT Dallas, uh, University of Texas at Dallas. And I completed a bachelor's degree there in computer science. And then I um, completed a master's degree there, also in computer science. Uh, so I probably spent uh, like a year and a half at community college and then like five years at UT Dallas, yeah. That's awesome. So isn't that kind of cool, community college? I'm looking at this back row because I know it's a lot of our students here um, that are present. I just want to put a little thing out there because I, our panelists, some of you don't know this, but this whole row starting with Emily, um, just got back from Puerto Rico. They went to the SACNES NDI STEM conference, which is a special professional conference for students from underrepresented backgrounds in science, technology, engineering, math, and allied health sciences. So friends, this is a panel especially for you. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and get into the scripted questions. So Jonathan, if I could start with you, please. As a staff member, how has being first generation shaped your teaching or interactions with current students? Um, yeah, so I, you know, at the beginning of last panel, everybody was thinking Ana Maria, and I also have an Ana Maria connection. Uh, Ana Maria, I used to, I used to work for GRPS, uh, and I used to teach Ana Maria's son, uh, but that's how we connected. And then she actually told me, well, you know, there's this opportunity to teach. Uh, pre-call at GVSU with TRIO. Um, and I was like, well, you know, I never done pre-call, and then I never actually gone and taught at, at GVSU, even though there were students from GRPS. But uh, just having that ability of like someone believing in you and saying, you know, you should try this out. Uh, and um, that was kind of like my initial step into, into being a faculty member. And it was great. I loved, I loved being in there. They were all like first generations, were well, soon to be first generation students from GRPS going to GVSU. And um, I loved teaching that class. And that's honestly what I have done ever since I've uh, been in the classroom at, at this level, which is just um, make classes really interactive, really fun, and uh, knowing that you don't have to be, uh, you you want to support the students where they are and then bring them to the level that, you know, the, the, the rigor that you want to provide for the class, but, but you know, making it fun and, and, and knowing that um, it's difficult or different for somebody that's first generation. Different learning styles, I think, oftentimes come mm -hmm. into play. Absolutely. Or and not even knowing how to study. That, that's a problem I had. I, I had no idea how to study. Agreed. For me, being a first-generation um, college student, it was, <laughs> I'll never forget the fear that was associated with that first day of class. You know, it's totally different than high school. Something, you know, you're doing something that no one in your family's really ever done before. My family couldn't even prepare me for what college was going to look like. My, my father was a um, hell of a worker and a great man, um, but never made it past the fifth grade. Um, and, but that was during those days where you could learn skills trades and still provide a, a good living for the family. Um, my mom graduated high school, traditional track of getting married, having children right away, and she was a stay-at-home mom until we got old enough, that thing. 
So when it came down to college for me, it was a crap load of pressure on me because I know everyone was watching me. Um, my older sister tried and failed, and I know she was, she was very smart. So for me, it's like, oh boy, if she failed, what does this mean for, for me? Um, what's really funny is those same fears hit me. After I graduated with my associate's degree, I had the same fears when I transitioned to get my bachelor's degree. And I thought, what in the world? Like, I thought I'd dealt with these when I enrolled in my master's course. It was the same fears of, you know, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? I'm the only one in my house or in the community that I grew up in that went to college. Like, am I, am I enough? And after years of teaching and talking to my students about efficacy and, you know, belief in self and all these other things, it's like when I enrolled for my PhD, those same feelings came back again. Am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Am I? And for me, when I, when I see my students, and I know I've got a couple of them out here now, um, they know right away. Like I, I tell them in the beginning of the semester, I, those emotions you feel, I felt them too. You, you know, sometimes we just need to know that others are feeling what we feel, you know, so that we don't think, man, this is just me, so I'm, maybe I don't have what it takes to be successful. Um, I just want them to know that you've got everything that you need right away to, to make this happen. You just, you gotta want it. And, and if we as an institution build a system of support around them, then there's nothing that they, they can't do. So I try to do that, introduce them to the resources that are available, but also be an open and active support for them myself. I love that. That's so true. Ale. <laughs> um, um, I feel like just trying to like connect with more of my Latino students has been a big part of how I work in TRIO and the connections that I made. I mean, how Vicky and I talk, it's like every baby that we get through those doors is different and they're gonna feel different and they're gonna go through different things all the time. Um, but one thing that I do connect with my Latino students is, you know, having your parents and them being behind you and cheering you on because they don't know what you're doing and they don't understand. You can explain it to them a bajillion different ways and they're still like, I don't, I, okay. Cool, great, you're doing awesome. Um, but just having that person like in our office, like so you can come and talk to, like I just feel so stressed, I feel frustrated, you know, and even, you know, kiddos come and stop by my office and they're like, I just need to talk to somebody in Spanish so I can get it out. Like <laughs> this out it, like just let it all out because I can't explain it in English. I'm trying to explain it to my parents, they don't understand I need somebody to talk to. Um, and how this is impacting my life and how I want to move forward, um, you know? And that's absolutely okay. There were many times, um, because I do have an older sister and I have a younger brother, um, and my sister was kind of like a tough cookie and she was figuring everything out. And when she figured everything out and I came along to unroll, she was like, you're gonna figure it out too. I'm only gonna help you if you're absolutely 100% struggling because you need to know every single thing and you need to learn how to ask questions and how to ask good questions. Um, you need to push yourself um, to be better and then hopefully help you know, our younger brother because he's looking up to you now too. Um, and so, you know, just finding the resources and having that little backup of like my older sister helped a lot. And I kind of bunny me like an older sister to, you know, the babies that are coming in because they are my brother's age and they are looking up to somebody to help them, you know. So just having that and, you know, I'm here for you guys if you guys need anything. Um, but yeah. Thanks. I appreciate that. Christy. Yeah. Um, everybody here doesn't matter where you are in, in the world, you view things with that lens of what's happened to me before. And so to answer the question, I always end up back in my freshman year, first semester, taking honors chemistry. I should not have been in honors chemistry. 
Um, and I got a D, and I was just like, seriously, a D? I mean, I want to be a doctor. How is that going to work? You know, so my career's over. What you know, all of that. And I had really a wonderful professor who reached out to me more than professors did at that time. I might be a little older than those on the panel. You might already notice that. Um, and he was really great. And so he reached out to me and he's like, I really think you know the information. Why don't we get together and talk about it? And so it was the very end of the semester and I knew there wasn't much I could do, but I stuck with it. I ended up retaking the class for obvious reasons. And I walked in on day two and knew it. I knew everything he was talking about. So I went to his office and I'm like, how is it that I can know what you're doing, but I just got a D in the last semester? And he said, I told you you knew more than you thought you did. And so I have to keep reminding myself of that, right? Because after I figured that out, things got a little bit better because I started learning how to study more. But that's the lens that I use, right? So whether I'm a professor, whether you're seeing me as the department head or the dean, you, we might be talking and I have to remember that, yeah, Christy Hake, you got Ds, you failed classes, and you still ended up in a pretty good spot. I love my job. Um, and so it's always with that lens. And Ennis, I just have to say, going back to what you were saying about that fear, I will tell you that for my first five years as a faculty member, I would go into class on the first day and still be nervous as a faculty member. And that's something I would I'd be like, how many people are nervous? And yep, and everybody would raise their hands, and I'd be like, so am I. So just, you're not alone. I think that's such an important thing so to make note of is that the nervousness never goes away. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're standing in front of a classroom of, you know, five students or 15 students or a lecture that's got 50 students in it. There's always that anxiety that happens on that first day of classes. Or if you're sitting in an office and you're meeting a student for the first time and just really hoping that you connect, like, oh, I hope I say the right thing. So I'm going to go, so Ennis, if you could answer this question, starting with you. What has been your experience since you were a first-generation college student? What's it been like working in higher education? That is a, that's a great question. <laughs> Thanks. It's, it's funny because when I, I was, um, I'll never forget when I was young. I had a uh, basketball, a football in my hand, and that's, that's what I knew, you know, was sports. Um, again, my dad never moving past the fifth grade, mom graduating high school. I didn't know of anyone who was successful academically. I didn't, I didn't experience that in my neighborhood. Um, a lot of people worked at the local factories and things like that. So if you were able to get a car with less than 100,000 miles on it and potentially own a home, that was success, you know? So, I mean, I didn't know of levels of success. I just didn't see that for me. Um, when, when I started taking my academics a lot more serious, and I started to kind of grow into that space and and um, I started to develop, you know, this, you know, sense of academic efficacy. At, at that point, you know, the sky just started to kind of be the limit for me. Um, I had some jobs that I kind of walked right into that I thought, man, these are nice, you know, I'm okay, I enjoy this. But it wasn't until I adjunct taught for my first time that I really found my space. You know, it's like, it's weird when you find a, you have a job, you enjoy it, that's fun, that's cool. But I swear, I tell my students this, I promise you, like, I feel like I could do this for free. Like, I can't believe I get paid to do this, you know. It's me being here um, has been so transformative, not just for me, but for my family, for my siblings that followed me, for students that, you know, see me in this space. You know, so for, again, for me, it's like, I never in a million years foresaw this for me. I just didn't see this. But now it's like, I can 
tell all of my students, like, you could do anything you, you want to do. Um, you just have to believe, you know. One of my students said to me, because he was on the wrong side of the building years ago, and uh, he said that, uh, he said, GRCC hiring? I said, absolutely. They're always looking for some help. He says, I want your job. I says, well, there you go. I'm glad you want my job. And this young man was, had no idea, but he was on the third floor of White. He was looking for 306, which is third floor of Sneedon. He had no idea. He was looking for my class. So I was like, hey, I'll show you where the class is. I'm thinking, I'll walk you to class first day. Like, this will be interesting. He said, I really do, I want your job. I said, okay, well, you know, you could, you could get that. He said, if, are they hiring? I said, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look when, we, when I get you to the classroom. He says, good. He said, because I hear the janitors here make pretty good money. And that, again, was another eye-opener that uh, for a first-gen guy, I mean, it just let me know that people, people that look like me aren't really in this position. You know, they don't, they don't usually transition through, you know, those levels of education and make it to being a college professor. So it's not just needed for first generation students for them to see me and for me to be here for my family, but it's for the community and for other students to see that it's possible for first generation students and students of color to be in positions to where they're, you know, college presidents or, you know, my Latino brothers and, and sisters could be deans, you know, at, at not just this institution, but institutions all over the country. We, we need more of this. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. Jonathan, what about for you? Um, so for me, um, I think my experience with, or how I'm approaching being in the classroom, it's different because I had a very different training as far as um, how I came about to be here at GRCC. I was part of a program called Teach for America. So um, I, it was like a very uh, intense training that happens over two years. Uh, I was also part of um, something that's called, well, it's typically called a boot camp, uh, where um, you learn how to program in a very short time. So um, I try to, when in the classroom, make sure that students are having fun. Um, definitely try to be as far away as, you know, death by PowerPoint or having a PowerPoint show in and just read from it. So I like to incorporate a lot of games, things that, um, that are not like maybe like your typical, what you will see as a typical experience in the classroom. But that's what I think first generation students need. Um, if you were able to just read from a textbook and just study like that, you know, we will all have college degrees. But you have to target it to what students need. Um, so that's how I, I approach it. And I think GRCC is positioned really well to do that. If you compare like other universities, I mean, definitely my experience was not like that at all, right? It, it was just like a lot of like dead by PowerPoint, a lot of like figuring it out, here's a project, you know, no help, you go ahead and do it, try to do it. Uh, but your CC allows that because you have so small classes and uh, you could have like that freedom of, of approaching a class without being afraid of uh, trying new things and, and learning new, new ways that could work for students. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Ale, what has it been like being a first-generation college student that's now working in higher education? Um, I would say that I would still consider myself a student. I'm still learning um, like you guys, even though you guys see me as a staff member up here um, with everybody else, you know. Hopefully one day I'll get my master's and my PhD. So every day that I come into the office and that you see me sitting at the front desk or sitting in my office, I'm learning a lot from not only you, but also like people like them um, and kind of setting new goals for myself as well. So even though I have graduated and I, you know, have my degree, I'm still planning those steps just like you are. I'm just like 
just do two steps before you guys, you know, moving up. Um, but I'm constantly learning and I feel like that mindset that I have that I'm always learning is that, um, you know, I can relate to you guys more, that I can talk to you guys more about things that are going on or things that I can help in, you know? So it's, I'm very grateful and I'm very blessed to be up here and to have the opportunity to work in higher ed. Um, and thank you, Vicky, for hiring me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, you know, we're still working towards a bigger goal. Um, and, you know, I have everybody to thank because I see you guys working hard. And, you know, I thought my bachelor's was going to be it. I was like, I'm done. That's all I have to give, you know? Um, and I see that a lot uh, in, a, in a lot of my students. I see that, like, I'm just going to get my bachelor's. I'm just going to get it done as fast as I can. And then here I am thinking the same thing. And then I talk to, you know, Vicky and Kaylee and Evan and Anna. And they're like, you have so much more to give. And you just don't see it. And, you know, that's one of the things that I've also learned is that, you know, you guys are kind of just, you know, sometimes in this little cloud that, you know, I just need to do this, I can't, I don't see anything else. And then it takes a person coming in from the outside to let you know, I see so much more in your future. I see so much more potential in you to kind of just push, you know, that student to obtain something more, to set new goals that they didn't think were possible. So that's been my experience. Thanks for sharing. Christy, how about for you? So as a biology professor, uh, I'm super focused on my research um, and teaching my classes. And one day my former boss came up to me and she's like, hey, I want to do this National Science Foundation grant and it's going to help first generation college students. And I'm like, hey, I'm a first generation college student. She's like, yeah, I know that's why I'm talking to you. Sometimes I'm a little slow. Um, and that experience absolutely changed my life. Um, I realized that that is where my purpose was. Um, I actually stopped doing biology research um, and I changed my focus to research with first generation students. Um, and that's what I published on. And that's the reason why instead of you know, staying in doing the, the professor route that I went and became a department head and a dean uh, because I thought I could do more for students um, in those roles. I love that, thank you. So the next question that I have, oh, I'm so sorry, just one moment. I got the question if you need me to read it. <laughs> We've been cheating the whole so, time. So, <laughs> My, my phone went to sleep. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Christy, actually, I was going to, if you would, okay. wouldn't mind starting us off on this one. If you wouldn't have pursued higher education, where do you think you would be today? This was so hard for me, and then I just reminded my brain to 17-year-old Christy, and I remembered. So I'm from Manistee, Michigan, right? And our neighbor was the um, head of Packaging Corporation of America. Uh, they made corrugated paper there, and I mowed his lawn. I can absolutely guarantee you I would have worked at the factory in Manistee, Michigan, because that was a lot of money. I mean, it's still a lot of money. That's what I would have done. That is so cool that yeah. you actually remember that. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Jonathan, what about for you? If you hadn't pursued higher education, where do you think you would be today? Um, I think I'll probably be a, a developer, so per, working in, in a software company. Uh, but at the same time, it just goes back to you know, even in, in being in that situation, you always have to develop people, develop, uh, grow developers, and I, I feel like I would have ended up teaching developers <laughs> again. So I, I really like being in that setting, so I probably would have ended up doing something like that. <laughs> yep. Thanks. Ale, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I, I looked at the questions ahead of time, you know. But I just genuinely don't know where I would be. I mean, there's so many things that I still do now, like on the side. <laughs> it's like, I'm still doing it. Um, but yeah, I just genuinely don't know where I would be. Um, maybe still working, you know, law, medical, you know, um, florist, plant taker, you know, caretaker. It's just, it's just too many things that I would like to do. I can never decide, so, yeah. So many varied interests. <laughs> she is really good at a lot of things. NS, what about for you? If you hadn't pursued higher education, where do you think you'd be? 
I would be probably working at the local factory or in prison. Now that's a lot, a lot of the people that I hung out with, some are dead and gone and others are just in and out of prison. So I, I probably would have been in, in the faculty or, or in that factory or, or locked up. That's my truth. I'm sorry, it's not like everybody else. No. <laughs> I, I was just a little more out there than they were, I guess. I think that's, so what I think is so interesting with first generation individuals in general is there is, there's, there's not a specific look to it, right? Like I look around this room and I think the majority of us in this room would identify as first generation college students and we all look different from each other. So it really can be a thing that you just don't know where somebody is coming from. But when we think of it from that perspective, as people who were first generation college students, what's a way that we can support each other now as first generation professionals? So first of all, we are all still first generation college students. Yes, we are. But I don't have an answer to your question. Give me, you have to give me a minute. <laughs> It's one of those off script questions because it's a, something that I think about often. You know, as I'm a first generation college student, I'm the first person in my family to work in an environment like this, and I rely a lot on my colleagues to bounce ideas off of and, and ask questions to because I've not been in a lot of the spaces um, that we need to go into as a professional. And so I often think about that is how. How can I give support? How can I ask for support? Because sometimes I don't even know what it is that I need to ask for help in. So not that's, oh, no, go ahead, go Ennis. For it, go nope. For it, go for it. Nope. I'm not stupid. That's my dean. I'm going to sit and I'm going to wait till she gets done here. Oh, no, you're no, going. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> I, I was talking to my students today about building support groups. I mean, we just, look, she's going, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's, to me, that was one of the most impactful moments of my life in graduate school when I had um, uh, three other individuals that wanted the same thing that I did. We all said, let's make this happen. Let's build a support group, you know? If there was a system that we could create, some sort of, you know, not, not therapy, but a support group of individuals that were first generation college students, we could bounce that information off of. Because sometimes it's not, it's not a lack of ideas, it's a lack of courage that we have. You know, it's like, man, I've got this amazing idea, but then, I don't know, I just, I don't wanna, I don't wanna feel stupid if I bring that, I don't want, I don't want somebody to laugh at me if I introduce this new idea. We still have those insecurities, those, those wounds. You know, I, I was telling my class, my, my father, when I um, started my PhD program, um, I probably completed three or four classes, and I'll never forget, I said something to my dad. We were all at this big family dinner, and, um, I said, yeah, you know, um, I've got, you know, a 4.0 going so far. And my dad said, mm, there you go. So my mom said, congratulations, baby. I knew you could do it. But my dad followed it up with, mm, so who do you got doing your homework for you? So, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up with that sort of thing you know, with people in the community that didn't believe in me, you know, and people even in my home that didn't believe. Those are the things that kick you in the gut, where it's like, you know, well, maybe I'll put that idea down and, and, and maybe it is stupid, you know. Maybe I shouldn't get my PhD. Maybe I shouldn't try to be a college professor because I don't want to be made to look stupid or feel inadequate, you know. But if we had a support group you know, of individuals who know what it's, I know what it feels like to, 
to feel like I don't matter, you know, or my thoughts and my ideas are, are meaningless. You know, maybe if we had that support group, that could be enough. You know, we don't have to do much, but maybe just post something and then we could get those affirming answers, you know. That's all we need is some reassurance, some positivity, you know. Okay, so support. I'm going to count on you to create that, that support group. Yeah. That would be awesome. That would be. So what you said is so close to what I was going to say is, mm. I mean, even to this day, I have to say to myself, your idea isn't stupid. You can go ahead and speak up. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be 49 years old this weekend, and I'm a dean. I have a PhD, and I still think, God, I hope my idea isn't stupid. It's so true. It's, <laughs> so I'm going to say it again. I'm going to be on repeat. And it's only because, especially for our students in, in the room, that we, it's not a magic piece of paper. When, when you get this degree or you get this diploma or you get that credential, it's not a magic piece of paper that makes those anxieties or those fears go away, but it, it is in trying to find other people that can understand where it is that you're coming from. And I really like the idea of having someone uh, around that can you know, encourage you, but I have, I have Anna and Evan and Maggie and Ale that speak really hard truth to me. Sometimes they are a little brutal in their constructive <laughs> criticism. <laughs> but it's really helpful because you need to have people around you that can give you that honesty, um, trusted people. What are some other things that as higher education professionals that you have found to be helpful in this career for you? Jonathan. Um, I mean, maybe maybe I going a little back to what was just described, just having that help or that support where you can hear other people's experiences that maybe haven't gone 100% um, the way they wanted to. Uh, like I shared that I, I, I got a master's degree at UT Dallas, but um, what I didn't tell you is that I actually was offered to complete a PhD program, and uh, it was it was too overwhelming for me to do it. So I finished my master's degree, and I was like, I'm out. I am not gonna be doing research for this. It's, it'll be too much. So um, you know, we sometimes we share our accomplishments, but then we don't share where we have failed or we haven't been as su successful as we wanted to. Um, for a long time, I wanted to uh, pursue a career as a, as a principal in a school. So I got a principal certification, and, but then that actually also never came to fruition because you know, it just, uh, I tried and, and the, like, the opportunity quite didn't uh, present itself. So, but that's just another example of uh, even after right, being a first generation and having a degree or maybe two degrees, you're still going to be failing and you're still going to be trying things that will not work out. Um, I mean, I took this job as interim AD, and I didn't you know if it was going to work out or not. <laughs> but it's just the things that you just have to keep trying new things uh, and have to be like seeking those failure opportunities because you never know uh, what will work or what wouldn't work. Absolutely. Ale, do you have anything you'd want to add? Um, I think that... Maybe it's because I, you know, I'm part of a younger generation. No shade, you guys. Wow. No shade. I cannot I believe said you that and I was like, dang it. That was so harsh. <laughs> wow. Shut her mic off, please. <laughs> um, no, but I think that um, being part of a newer generation, like, I have grown more comfortable in saying, like, you know what, I just straight up messed up. I'm sorry. Let me go back and figure stuff out because I'm not 100% sure on what I'm doing and giving myself grace. And like, I tried it, did not work. I apologize. I will be right back until I actually like figure out what I'm doing. And I feel like a lot of my students do that now. Um, and even when you, you, you just, you know, you're, you feel embarrassed and you're just like, you know, um, saying, apologizing, like, hey, I'm not quite there yet, but let me come back and revisit it. It takes a lot. 
Um, and I see more of my students doing that and I hope they continue to do that and addressing like, hey, I messed up. And it doesn't have to be something like bad. It's just, you're gonna correct your mistake and you're gonna work on it. It doesn't mean that, you know, you're not trying. Um, but I, I have seen that people take more, a little bit more accountability to the stuff that they're doing, so yeah. I'm so sorry I called you guys old. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't. I actually don't think you called them old until just that moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like right there. Right there. Yeah. It's right there. Take um. the microphone away. <laughs> Does anyone in the audience have a question for our panelists? Hi guys, thank you for being here, sharing your stories. Uh, my name is Nali and um, I'm a business and music major. This is my last year. I'll be graduating next year, hopefully. <laughs> I was, yeah, thank you. I would say hopefully, but yes, I know I'm working hard for that. I know all of you work hard for, us, for that as well. Um, the question that I have is for all of you. If you, uh, have you ever regret not doing something and doing, yes, in general, doing something better uh, during your education? <laughs> there are like small things I would have done. I mean, there are so many classes that I would love to have taken. I had, it was like one class away from an American ethnic studies minor. Okay, well, I actually would have totally gone in that direction by the time I got through it all versus neuroscience. I, it, it was just more me. I keep trying to think about it. I just, I don't think so. I think every, I took some, I had some serious barriers that got in the way of me being able to be successful at times, you know, where I failed the class here or there, and I second guessed, you know, my ability to graduate. I remember at one point I was like, you know what, screw this, I'm gonna go to ITT Technical Institute. And then I was like, ah, I don't even know what I'm doing with that, so I better stick with this. Um, but I think everything happened for, all those failures, they all happened for a reason. And they literally molded me for the position that I, that I have right now. I mean, it's, there isn't anything that my students could say that would shock me. You know, I know what it's like to be a single parent and trying to go to school full time, not having any financial support. You know, I was a single dad at 18 years old. You know, so, and it wasn't one, it was twins. So, you know, try lugging two kids around and college and basketball and traveling and all of these other things, I mean, it was, it was very stressful, but I needed all of that to prepare me for the drama that my students unpack and deliver to me daily, you know? So, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't change a thing, and I'm, I'm just blessed that I was able to, to push, push, and then get everything done so that I could, you know, be where I'm at. That's a great question. We have time, I think, for one, one more question for our panelists. Does anyone else have a question they want to ask? <laughs> this one is for, I want to say your name, it's Christy, right? So you said you're a doctor. How do you balance being a doctor with family? Because that's the one thing I always worry about. So I think the question you're asking is about a clinical physician. Right. Well, I even mean like with, I guess all Just of you guys, even with being higher education. Incredibly like busy. That. How do you yeah. balance incredibly busy with family? <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Um, you know what? I'm not the person to ask that question. No. I answer that question. I, well, may, okay, maybe I am. I never had children. Um, I adopted two teenagers at different points in my life. And so this is why I'm the person to answer it. I didn't feel like I could do the one job adequately by having like babies. No, 
and still do the work that I did. Every person is different. Yeah. That is the most important thing for you to hear in this story. Anybody else? Jonathan? I'll, I'll have Alejandra. kids. Alejandra? Jen have kids. Okay. Yeah. I'll have kids yet. Oh, yeah, you're too young. You're too young to have them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sorry. I've already got three kids. I understand. 100%. <laughs> so I don't have um, children at the moment. Um, but I do, you know, and this is where it differs um, between family. Um, I have a lot of like health concerns and my mom has had multiple accidents. She had a spinal fusion um, and they relied on me a lot. Um, and you know, I love my family and I would do anything for my family. Um, they are my rock. So just balancing being that caregiver, you know, I love my parents. I'm gonna take care of them, good or bad. Um, you know, it sometimes take a, takes a toll on your mental health, but then that's when you have to, you know, be honest and kind of tag team it with some of your other family members or, you know, it's kind of like a give and take, you know? Yeah. I'm trying to help, but, you know, at a certain point, I'm going to have to have somebody, you know, help me too, because I need that help too. It's just not that person that's injured. You know, I'm taking a hit as well. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like that, but... Yeah, I mean, I don't have kids because I'm young, but, you know, I still have family. <laughs> it is but, still family. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have to time manage like crazy. You have to build a system that allows you to be successful with the family, also with your work and academics and everything else. You've got to decide what's going to be your priority. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because my we're sitting here talking and you asked that question, my phone lit up and my 13 year old had called me, Dad, I left I left my money for the field trip right there on the counter. Can you bring it to me? I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> like nah, you you'll learn. You you you'll learn. You know, but there was a time in my life where I would stop and everything you know, revolved around me, making sure my kids had everything. That that came and went. You know, like, and I'm not saying it in a bad way. I'm saying I think me always fixing things prevents them from being their best version of themselves. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, I can't, I can't always do this for you. You've got to learn through some hard lessons, and maybe missing a thing here or there. You know, my parents didn't fill in the gaps for me every time I made a mistake, you know, so I can't be that shield protecting them from their bad choices, you know, so I'll get to it some point today. If it's too late, it's too late. This, you've you've got to learn from it. You've got to create a system that allows you to become successful and recognize that your mental health is the most important thing. Like, I can't help, you know, my mom had a stroke, and all of, I, can't, I can't help my mom and dad if I don't help myself first, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, we're all very busy, right? So, um, I'm actually the, more like on the opposite side where I, probably would like to emphasize more career and uh, but you have to I have a really great wife and uh, the person that you get with or that you pair up with has to kind of balance you so she's the one that's been helping me be more towards family rather than career so uh, you gotta you gotta figure out what is it that you're looking for in somebody and then try to like match your set of skills yeah, yeah. That was a great question. Thanks for asking it. Well, it is 123. I wanted to give the panel an opportunity just to give some final thoughts to the group, whether it's as a professional that you are now, whether that was to throw it back to the college student that you were. Is there anything that you'd want to share with the group in our parting moments? Christy. Nothing goes exactly as planned. Always have a plan B, and that's okay. <laughs> I've been lost this whole time. I'm like, where am I? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, 
just try your best. Give yourself grace. Um, take care of your mental health, you know? Um, because at the end of the day, you're gonna have to live with yourself. So just take care of yourself and love yourself, you know? Put yourself first sometimes. Sometimes being first is okay. So, yeah. <laughs> gentlemen uh, yeah i would say for sure ask for help right from us like you know we are your cc employees have the ability to provide a lot of resources to uh all of you as students so just ask for help and and somebody will definitely reach out in one way or another so um you know our the office of stem is, is here for you or trio or whichever other office you think might help you just reach out thank you ns just don't allow anybody to have so much power in your life to where they can tell you that you're never going to become anything and you believe it. Um, the, the, the other thing is have healthy people around you. I mean, it's really hard to become successful when you're dragging dead weight with you. If your friends don't want it, you're trying to drag them with you. I mean, it's just a matter of time before you get so tired to where you give up. So have healthy people around you and keep a healthy mindset and you'll be fine. I think that's really great advice and not just advice to for students, but advice for us as professionals too. So we have come to the end of our second panel on our inaugural First Generation Celebration Day. I cannot be more grateful and thrilled that all of you joined us today. I think we've had some pretty awesome conversations today. And we do have a raffle that we're gonna get into, but before we do that, I just wanted to, if we can take a moment and thank our panelists for joining us today.